Hello, everybody, and welcome to the March 24th episode of Trips and Traps. I'm Andy Serling, joined by Eric Donovan. And we have uh, three, three races to bring you this week in one segment. We'll start off with the seventh race from March 18th, Thursday, and this is a now winners one allowance. And we're kind of interested in, in the slow pace in here and how it affects some horses. Yeah, and it's not as though there are any trips in this race, uh, really, that matter. Now, January Gent, the three, is the heavy favorite in this race. And, 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 and I was surprised to see how far back he was. There he is right there. What's interesting is that No Questions, who's the five, is ahead of him. Now, No Questions is a deep closer, so you would not expect to see him that, ahead of January Gent. And considering it's, this pace is excruciatingly slow for the day and for these kind of horses, and no surprise, the horses run one, two. So the two questions you have to ask is, what's up with January Gent that he has no speed and is far back? And you'll see the rider start to motivate him at some point, and he has no run. But no questions who closed into a slow pace last time against inferior horses. He's close to the pace, and I thought he ran exceptionally well. Yeah, no, no questions running in a $25,000 claiming race last time. I thought this was a huge step up in class for him, especially considering that he didn't get the pace and he was closer than he has been you know, in, in the races before. He ran huge in here, and we'll take a look at both the horses. Yeah, I mean, there's no questions now. And Fernando Hara, you know, what was he supposed to do? He, he had no choice. The pace was so slow. And here, here is in the back is January Gent, the heavy favorite. And once again, you can see the rider was trying to motivate him, and he just, you know, maybe it was partly because obviously the field sped up during the race, so he couldn't really rally at that point. But I think it's a very bad sign for January Gent, who had had mediocre form, then got a perfect trip and a breakout performance for Rick Dutrow. Then he comes back heavy favorite here. I don't want him in the future, but I'll tell you what, I want no questions in a fairly run race. I agree with you there, and I think January Gent's a horse that, uh, you know, we kind of knocked the first time he ran here on the inner track. He had run at Finger Lakes, you know, after a horse that had showed such good form that you would figure would stay uh, on the Naira circuit for Rick Dutcher to send him up to Finger Lakes. We thought that was a you know a question mark about him. He did lose that race, but he did come back and win with that perfect trip last time. Yeah, and I feel like that win, that'll be the win for him because I don't, I don't want him after this race. I know the race was against him the way it was run, but he, I just don't think if he was in good form, he would have been that bad. The good January gent would have been closer. No questions is a dead closer. You don't really want him going long. You want him sprinting, and I look forward to an opportunity of him getting in a fairly run race, and I think with his current form, it's a, he's a lot better than he looks. All right, we'll take a look at our next race now, and this is the eighth race from March 19th. We're going to take a look at the four, uh, the two to lose the track and the one. Shop Tate, similar kind of deal with the pace kind of slowed here and how it affects some of these horses. Right. Now, Shock Tate's on the rail. He has no speed. But Toulouse Lautrec, who's the heavy favorite here, he's outside of him. Yes, he's more comfortable stalking, but looking at his PPs, Toulouse Lautrec is a horse capable of speed. There's no speed on paper. And it's, uh, to me, he's just getting a very sort of passive ride in here. And you have to know going in, the, there's a good chance of the way the race develops. And obviously, the horse who wins this race, Mount Glivermore, who had a big chance, was clearly the horse who could take advantage of the lack of pace, which Channing Hill did. I thought David Cohen made a very tactical error by passively riding. You're up there, you've got to get in there, and you make him run. You make him run, he speeds off from you, that's fine. And here he is now taking back. Shop Tate, of course, a victim of all of this. I thought he ran well. Yeah, I mean, you take a look at where these horses are going to finish. Shop Tate finishes second here. Toulouse Lautrec finishes fourth. And, you know, Shop Tate just as up against it as Toulouse Lautrec was as far as the pace concerned and has to go wide here as well. No, no question. He ran a far better race, Shop Tate. I mean, Shop Tate showed a real return to form, and he's one who's had good form. Toulouse Lautrec, I'm not sure what to do because he obviously the promising colt had this very big win on the inner. Good trip that day, obviously, but big win. But I, I, I still don't want to give up on him. I know he gets tired chasing inside. I don't know how much different it would have been. I just am surprised he was given the same kind, the kind of ride he was. Yeah, I would have liked to have seen a more aggressive ride than myself. I would have liked to have seen him up there either uh, fighting with the six Mount Glittermore for the lead or, you know, I, if he really wanted the lead, he could have probably had it from Mount Glittermore. Uh, I agree. He could have, and he could have asserted himself. Now, we're not saying he would have won. Maybe he wouldn't have. And it's a decision. And it just, to me, sometimes, look, you fall victim to situations, as the one Shop Tate did there. On the other hand, this was a race that you could see on paper, and we talked about it before the race. There was a complete lack of speed in here. And Mount Glittermore obviously was in a position to take advantage of it, but it was up to Toulouse Lautrec to not let him get that advantage, and he had the speed to do that, and it didn't work out. All right, well, I'm going to race to show you, and we'll take a look at a race from Sunday. This is race number six. The nine is Spicy Steve, the one's big gavel. Spicy Steve doesn't break all that alertly here, and I would have liked to have seen uh, the rider take back at this point instead of trying to send him up and get position, because he's going to end up four wide on the first turn. Yeah, I mean, there's no question, and there, there's Spicy Steve out here. Big gavel's down in here, and we'll show a little a little bit of steadying with him later, though. I'm not thrilled with him. Spicy Steve, on the other hand, look, 
it's a situation where, you know, we've talked about this a lot going in the first turn, these two turn races. You've got an outside post. You better have a plan and you better be able to execute it a little bit. Once you break slow, as you said, you can't do this. Yeah, no, to be up there four wide and, you know, at this point here, he's committed to going on with it, uh, which would be okay, except he's going to try to slow it down a little bit when they get when he gets toward the front and it causes a whole jam up on the field. And we'll take a look at where the one big gavel is steadying in behind a little bit uh, right now as they straighten away down the back stretch. And the race really kind of changes because you know Fergoso expends a lot of energy uh, on the nine spicy Steve to try to get him to where he is but you know once he gets to where he is he doesn't want him there anymore he takes it back and the whole field kind of is right on top of him as soon as he knows it right and it, you know it caused problems as you'll see for for, for a big gavelly show before even raffinator who's out here and finishes second in the race he kind of gets jammed because Rosie wanted to rate him and the whole thing and you see and this is something we see in some of these inner races and it's not it's not the faults of, of, of people like Rosie Napravnik riding the eight raffinator David Cohen and the one they just sort of get skunked now they speed up a little bit, they get away. I tell you, I didn't like Spicy Steve in this race, and this is a race that Jason and I had talked about quite a bit. He had run well sprinting. This is his second time going a route. He needs a turn back. I wouldn't bet him going along in any situation, but now we go to the main. He goes seven furlongs, six to seven furlongs. Spicy Steve is better than he looks, and he had no shot in this race. Yeah, no shot here, and he does finish last in here, which is a little bit of a concern, I guess. Does get beat 20 and a half lengths. There's no fight left in the stretch, but maybe that'll help your price. Next time, I think you're absolutely right. I think he does need a turn back here. We'll see Big Gavel come on for, you know, it looks like he's going to finish a little better than where he actually does here. He ends up finishing fourth. He, you know, looks like he's going to have more in the stretch. Right. I'm going to tell you something. Here's Big Gavel out here. Raffinator comes inside of him. The fact that, that, that Big Gavel couldn't get by the Big long shot the big long shot in this race strings and arrows is on the rail in this at this spot to me this is a very bad sign I don't think that it's funny because somebody was asking me on Twitter if I thought Big Gavel had a tough trip in here and, and I don't think he did Big Gavel's just had too many chances in races that he was supposed to be able to win mm -hmm. to continue to be a maiden I don't want him Spicy Steve I kind of like that he finished last in this race from a betting perspective because he's not a distant source he had no chances he showed with the way the race was run and if he cuts back into a sprint he can win so it makes great racing a great game. You don't like Spicy Steve at all in this race, and you see something that happens, and next time out, you can actually like him in a different situation. Right. It, all, it also shows, you know, and, and believe me, I, you know, I'm as guilty as anybody. You've you got to be careful about marrying yourself to horses you don't like. Not liking them one day doesn't mean you have some sort of personal dislike of them. It means you don't want to bet them in that race. Well, that'll do it for this episode of Trips and Traps. Keep in mind, we love to hear your comments. You can email us at tripsandtraps at nairainc.com.